Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. Apparently Bach bought it for his personal use. And the labyrinth is a kind of guide. It's saying, just follow me. It's a truth, and truth is delivered in many different fashions. Today on Spotlight, an art form designed to inspire spirituality. Meet the group in Kirkwood creating these designs. Plus, peaceful projects that are meant to help you let go. How a muralist found this new passion. And then a WashU professor and Michelangelo expert talks about the artist's final years. But first, a rare book at Concordia Seminary. Find out what was discovered in the margins. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. On the campus of Concordia Seminary in Clayton, in the Christine K. Hasse Memorial Library, back behind the Rare Book Reading Room, which is adjacent to the Rare Book Storage Room, is where you'll find this library's rarest book of all. So valuable, we can't show you exactly where they keep it, but we can show you exactly what it is. Apparently Bach bought it for his personal use. Yes, that Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach. And this was his family Bible. And not just any Bible, but a three-volume study Bible, published in German with commentary by Lutheran theologian Abraham Kalov. But it's not Kalov's commentary that makes this Bible priceless. The really fascinating thing about this Bible is it's not just Bach's signature on the title page. We have his marginal annotations and some fairly lengthy comments throughout. And his comments on passages where he talks about music in the Old Testament celebrations and things like that are, are really pretty interesting for Bach scholars to look at. Take, for example, Bach's comments, handwritten in German, scribbled alongside 2 Chronicles 5. The note that Bach writes in the margin here says, note well where there is devotional music, God with his grace is always present. The story of how Concordia Seminary came into possession of the Bach Bible is itself a tale of biblical proportions. Beginning with a German immigrant who bought it from a used bookseller in Philadelphia in the early 1800s. They think this marking somehow indicated the price. The buyer was Ludwig Rieschle, who eventually passed it on to his son, who lived in Michigan. In 1934, a pastor from Detroit went to a conference of the Synod in Frankenmuth, Michigan, and stayed with his cousin's family. His cousin's husband wanted to show him an old German Bible that his father had had. And he brought it down, showed it to this pastor, and the pastor noticed right away Bach's signature on the title page. The pastor, knowing the president of Concordia Seminary was a Bach enthusiast, told him about the Bible. In 1938, Concordia's president acquired it for the library. It is quite a story. Nobody really knew it was here. Between when the seminary acquired the Bible and 1962, nobody actually paid much attention to it. In fact, they sort of rediscovered it when they moved into this new library from the old one. Scholars have been studying it ever since. Bach's substantive comments are few and far between, but when he does offer his thoughts, they seem to close the book on long-held notions that Bach was not particularly devout, even though he wrote a lot of church music. Bach was a very religious person, a very convinced Lutheran. What that side note says is, note well, this chapter is the true foundation of all God-pleasing church music. It seems he's looking for this in the Bible, the connection between music and worship and music and God. The Bach Bible has undergone years of scrutiny to verify its authenticity. 
In 1982, it was sent off to a lab at UC Davis for some very advanced testing of the ink, which, which they could really do for the first time without destroying a sample. They proved that it is consistent with what Bach would have had at hand for ink, that it matched other samples, and so it was kind of beyond a reasonable doubt actually his writing. A facsimile of the Bach Bible has been published and is for sale. And on rare occasions, the original is put on public display, like at the seminary's annual Bach birthday celebration. They're in awe, especially if they're Bach fans. In fact, we just had a group here from Japan that viewed the Bible, and, and they were kind of stunned silence for a minute. <laughs> There are 6,000 books in Concordia Seminary's rare book collection, each with a story to tell. But the real value of the Bach Bible is that it speaks volumes about the person who owned it. The big thing we learn about Bach from looking at especially his notes in the Bible is the way he thought about music and God, how he combined his faith and his work and really thought about what it means that music is being performed in a church. He saw a very deep connection there, perhaps a connection that transcends words. HEC Media, bringing you culture and community. Find all of HEC's positive programming and award-winning content at hecmedia.org. A song from the Interfaith Concert, later on Spotlight. Stained glass, as an art form, has been a source of inspiration in churches for centuries. Few other art forms have quite the same ability to evoke feelings of spirituality. Artisans say their task is to create beautiful art that connects people to a higher power. It's not simply a written text that we're trying to illustrate. It's a truth, and truth is delivered in many different fashions. On a wooded hilltop in Kirkwood, Missouri, you'll find a talented group of stained glass designers, cutters, and painters. Emil Fry stained glass has been passed down through five generations. For years, the Fry family and their employees have put heart and soul into the creation of stained glass with designs that often reflect the times. It's kind of the forge that every Fry must go through. You don't go into art to make money. <laughs> you, you go into it because you have a calling and a passion for it. And for us, that's, that's tied largely to our faith and to our family. Emil Fry Sr. was born in Bavaria in 1869. He and his wife Emma found a familiar refuge in St. Louis's large community of German immigrants. Fry was known for the Munich pictorial style, in which panes of colored glass are meticulously hand-painted. Emil Fry Jr. took over the studio in 1942. His most acclaimed work, The Windows at St. Francis Xavier College Church on the campus of St. Louis University. Stained glass is the last part of the church to be done. Uh, it was done in the late 20s and early 30s. Um, and they describe the, uh, in the nave, the Jesuit saints, but the west-facing windows uh, which is the depiction of the Trinity in the heavenly court, came from his experience of being a Chartres. Emil Fry Jr. soon brought a mid-century modern aesthetic to the studio's designs. He employed artists such as Charles Eames, Siegfried Reinhardt, and Robert Harmon. The baton was passed to Robert in 1963, then Stephen in 1990, and today, 36-year-old Aaron is at the helm. When beginning a new project, the first challenge Fry designers face is to identify the needs of the church or organization and to make sure the stained glass enhances the architectural design. What we do is an architectural art. 
It's, it's rather unique in that respect. At least the realization of the success comes finally when we install it. And that, that really is a treat. And the way it can transform a space. Whereas before you had just empty windows, suddenly you have um, shades of amber light coming through and basking the pews. Fry windows are often very large, and to have really intense bright colors on that type of scale can be a little overwhelming. Fry artisans use techniques handed down through the centuries with hand-blown glass imported from Germany. If paint is applied, the glass is fired in a kiln, then the pieces are soldered together into a lead framework. A recent project in Florida gave artist John Whedon the chance to create windows in the traditional Munich pictorial style. It's a, an older church. It has Gothic windows. It's, a, uh, it's I would say, a sort of a neo-Gothic church. I really wanted to do something, and as did we, something that felt like it felt in the character of the church. Each individual piece of glass is painted. Each individual stroke is a hand-painted piece of artwork, and that is really what gives the the piece, you know, this look of a painting in entirety is that it really is every single piece is painted. All of the Fry artisans agree, creating art with a sacred connection is a humbling experience. And here's the, the work we, we make it tends to last a long time and it impacts a lot of people. We get an occasional letter from uh, a visiting uh, person or a parishioner that says, hey, I was at this church, I was in a bad spot, I was by myself, and the, the light was just basking through the windows, and I felt at peace. How many other occupations can give you that sort of response? First person, real world, expert driven. That's the focus of the videos, lesson plans, and activity ideas you'll find at our educational website, educate.today. Robert Fishbone is known as a muralist, but lately he has found a new passion, designing and creating labyrinths. I had seen some labyrinths around and they really intrigued me. As I was evolving my spiritual path, and looking for more ways to be engaged in contemplative practices, a labyrinth started just calling out to me. I had somebody who knows me well say the difference between a mural and a labyrinth. With a mural, one's reaction is often, ooh, and in a labyrinth, it's, ah. So we're kind of reaching at two different ends of the spectrum of like what it is to be a human. A labyrinth is an ancient symbol of wholeness. It represents a journey or a path to our own center and back out into the world again. While they are found all over the world in different forms, the labyrinth in the cathedral at Chartres, France is considered the most archetypical one. It's important to also distinguish a labyrinth from a maze. A maze usually has very tall walls that you can't see above, and it's meant to confuse you. A labyrinth, on the other hand, is at ground level, so you always know exactly where you are. There's only a single path, and once you make the commitment to step across the threshold, it can only lead you to the center of all things. They all serve the same purpose. Letting go of your life up until that moment and walking with as few attachments as possible. And hopefully by the time you reach the center, there will be a little more lightness that, that we can experience. While taking a walk in nature may bring a sense of peace, there is a significant difference while walking a labyrinth. In a labyrinth, you only make one choice, which is to do it, to step across the threshold. And once you make that commitment, you can let go of everything else because the labyrinth itself is going to guide you into the center. Now, if you take a walk in nature or your neighborhood, oh, I'll walk down this path, I'll go this way, oh, I'm going to look at this, I'm going to look at that. You know, there's so many distractions. We may think we're in nature, but really we're like still engaged with everything. Labyrinths have long been used as meditation and prayer tools. And for centuries, 
they have been associated with mysticism. In the Celtic world, say Great Britain, that, that whole area, who did adopt Christianity, but they melded it with their own belief, which had to do much more with nature. And so you will find the, the labyrinths like in that part of the world really are imbued with all this kind of otherworldly mysticism. Of course, anytime you engage in a spiritual activity, you are talking about what we can't see, what we can't name, what we don't entirely know. In that sense, mysticism is a big part of this. And, and what is mysticism? It's about something you don't understand. There are many labyrinths in the St. Louis area, one of the most beautiful being the labyrinth on the grounds of the Mercy Conference and Retreat Center. A little over 20 years ago, Sister Corlita Bonarens had an idea that the Mercy Conference and Retreat Center could benefit from having a labyrinth. They got in touch with Robert Ferre here in St. Louis, who had done hundreds of labyrinths. And working with them, he designed this beautiful labyrinth that's behind me. It's about twice as large as the one it's modeled after, the one in Chartres, France. And the reason for that is to allow the paths to be very wide. It also um, follows th that exact same design in that there's Christian imagery in different elements that are built into it. We will take a look at several more around St. Louis that Robert Fishbone designed and helped build all of which are associated with faith communities, beginning with the labyrinth at Central Reform Congregation. Looking at various designs, I realized that one that's somehow related more to Judaism would obviously make more sense um, in a Jewish community. The city of Jericho became the design for the labyrinth at Central Reform Congregation. And there is a beautiful rendering of it in an old Babylonian Talmud from the early 1000s. And that's what I used to design our labyrinth. The site for the labyrinth at the Villa de Chain Oak Hill School is beautiful, secluded like this. It was built by people from the community. We did it in silence. People always remark how profound the experience is, working with others in silence, creating what's gonna be a spiritual element on a campus made in a spiritual way. It just keeps deepening. What is all this about? The labyrinth at the Episcopal Church is similar to the one that's behind me, um, but it's smaller. You know, they definitely are using it for uh, faith purposes, but like the one at CRC and this one, it's open to the public. While labyrinths like these take on many forms, they are all a place of peace and serenity, healing body, mind, and spirit. These days, it's hard to find what I would call a wholesome spiritual guide in life. We're barraged so much by the digital world and so many different voices. And the labyrinth is a kind of guide. It's saying, you take your first step, just follow me. <laughs> I'll get you where you need to go. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Think of Rome, and you might think of the Vatican. Think of the Vatican, and you might think of the Sistine Chapel. Think of the Sistine Chapel, and you probably think of Michelangelo. But he was far more than a painter. Michelangelo, the greatest artist of the Renaissance, was truly a Renaissance man, a sculptor, a poet, and in his final years, primarily an architect. Part of the transformation of the Rome we know today is because of Michelangelo's architectural projects in the late 70s and 80s of his life. And his biggest project of all was at the Vatican. But it wasn't the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It was St. Peter's Basilica. At 70, he's well deserves to retire. And the Pope comes and says, you're taking over St. Peter's, the largest, most complicated architectural project in the world. Michael Andrews just can't believe it. He's 70 years old, he has no business taking over such a project. But you do not say no to a Pope. 
And William Wallace just can't seem to say no to Michelangelo. Dr. Wallace is a professor of art history at Washington University and an internationally recognized authority on Michelangelo, whose seventh book about the artist, called Michelangelo, God's Architect, tells the story of the artist's final years and greatest masterpiece. If you ask who's the greatest engineer of the Renaissance, everybody would say Leonardo da Vinci. We have 6,000 pages of Leonardo's drawings and all kinds of brilliant engineering ideas. But Leonardo didn't actually carry out any of those engineering ideas. Michelangelo just did it. He didn't talk about it, he didn't draw it, he just did it. And he accomplished enormously complicated and impressive engineering feats all through his life. So he had an engineering skill and knowledge that was uh, of a depth beyond anybody else of his time. And it started with the fact that he was a sculptor. He was bringing marble blocks from the Carrara quarries 90 miles from Carrara to Florence. And these were blocks that are eight tons, larger than anything that had been moved since Roman times a thousand years before. So he had to rethink how the Romans had done this and how they had transported these materials, how they lifted eight tons and move them 90 miles. So that was the beginning of his engineering knowledge, which helps, of course, in building a building. Well, you talk about, too, using the donkeys to haul these things and this kind of system that he arranged uh, around uh, with ramps and so forth to get the donkeys to haul that up there. This was a brilliant innovation in St. Peter's. We don't actually know, unless you climb the dome in St. Peter's, because you climb the dome and come down one of these helical ramps. There are four of them in the corners of the dome. And these are enclosed ramps, circular helical ramps that go up. And these were designed by Michelangelo so that he could carry the materials, the building materials, sand, bricks, water, and the stone, up 200 or 250 feet. And the donkeys were carrying these up these ramps. And of course, if the donkeys knew they were 250 feet up in the air, they would have frozen and they wouldn't have moved. But Inside these helical ramps, they were very comfortable and they were very easy to carry these heavy, heavy weights up. So this is one of these brilliant inno innovations that Michelangelo came up with. Well, and the, of all the parts of St. Peter's that people would picture, I think, when they first picture St. Peter's, in their mind at least, is the dome. The sad thing is, of course, Paul, is that Michelangelo never saw that dome completed. Some people complain, well, it, Michelangelo would have changed his mind and the dome isn't exactly what we expect. Yes, he probably did change. He changed his mind every single day. Every single day when on the architectural site, he changed his mind. But the dome is the dome that he basically designed, and he would have been perfectly, I think, content to see it rise all the way <laughs> to what we have today. Michelangelo knew he would never live long enough to see St. Peter's completed. But despite new problems and old age, he persevered because Michelangelo was never building St. Peter's for himself. Well, as he said, he ended up working for God. Um, at, at the end, it was, it was no longer working for his friends or his family. He, the person he was working for was God. Watch the full interview to find out why the St. Louis Arch has a unique similarity to St. Peter's Basilica. It's at hecmedia.org. HEC celebrates St. Louis like no other media outlet highlighting those making a difference through science and technology. It's a wonderful community of young entrepreneurs who are all doing very amazing things. Focusing on arts and education. Poverty is not going to stop a student from getting a quality education. We can't let that happen. Broadcasting meetings and functions to educate and inform our community. St. Louis feels like a city on the road to extraordinary things. Producing compelling documentaries celebrating our region. Henry Shaw founded the Missouri Botanical Garden, one of the first of its kind in the country and one of the best of its kind in the world. Visit agcmedia.org for up-to-date locally produced stories about the people and organizations who make St. Louis great.
Next week, a local organization helping families and caregivers of pediatric heart patients. Plus, sap to syrup, it's maple sugaring time in Missouri. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.